Hello, Internet friends. Chris Masto here. I'm outdoors for once. This is definitely not my natural habitat, but I'm here with my brand new Kohler 24RCL 24 kilowatt standby generator. This thing just arrived yesterday. It's not hooked up, it was just delivered, so I'll have to do some more videos once it gets hooked up in the process of all that, and then finally reviewing it and trying it out. But now that it's here physically, I can talk about the unit itself and a little bit about what it took to get it here because this has been a project and a process. It is currently November 20th, 2021. Uh, and I started this a couple of months ago and I just got it and it's still gonna be a couple of months until it's up and running. So when you get to this type of generator, there are basically two different kinds depending on what sort of motor it has. There's air cooled and liquid cooled. Sort of the difference between like a lawn mower engine and a car engine. Now, obviously this means that the liquid cooled generators can be larger because at some point you have to do that in order to dissipate the additional heat of a larger generator. They also tend to run quieter because they can run at a lower speed with the larger engines. And in general, it's debatable whether they're more reliable or not. That, that is up in the air. I convinced myself that it's probably more reliable, but that may or may not be true. Um, also, in terms of maintenance, I think the maintenance might be more on the liquid cooled generator because there's more stuff you have to replace. But I'm hoping that this thing is in it for the long haul. These are only for power outages, and they're not meant for people who are like living off the grid and want to run the thing 24 7. It, it will definitely die if you try to run it 24 7. But the question I had was how long can you run it? because we had a week-long power outage a couple of years ago, and that was what really cemented in my mind, uh, having had to sit in the house with no power for a week. Uh, it's very unpleasant. So I wanted to be able to bridge kind of longer power outages, and I felt like the liquid-cooled generator is more likely to be able to stand up to that sort of abuse. Now, you do have to shut it down periodically. I checked with the manufacturer. Actually, Kohler is great. I called their phone number, someone answered, immediately in the Kohler power division, separate from the plumbing company, I suppose. But when I called the Kohler power number, somebody talked to me right away and I explained what I was curious about, which was sort of how long can you run this thing? What sort of maintenance do you have to do? Gave me all the answers. If you go by what the manufacturer says, if you have a long power outage like that, you do have to shut it down, occasionally change the oil, things like that. But I do think, again, because the engine is running at a lower RPM, and because it has the additional cooling, I think it's more likely to, to be able to handle it if, for example, we had to run it for a few days straight. So let's go over what it took to get this thing. Some people I'm aware live in Montana or some kind of place where you can just do whatever you want. But here in New York, in Long Island where I live, we have a lot of regulations. Our town has a lot of building codes. So there are a lot of permits that need to be filed for anything that you do. And a generator is certainly no exception. So the company that we bought the generator from, of course, they do the work with the permits, but a lot of this process was us just waiting and uh, occasionally having to go back and answer some questions. This thing weighs over a thousand pounds. It's very difficult to move and has to be on a four inch concrete base. So that was one of the big challenges here. You might be able to see a little opening here. There's an opening in the fence that's sort of where the fence goes over, I, I had to remove that section of fence so they could bring it through. That's the biggest space there is to get into my backyard. When I look online and I see a lot of people with videos about their generator delivery, they're just coming, you know, they put it on a, a bobcat or something and bring it into the back. Not an option here. So what the guys did was they just put it on rollers, you know, like big metal rolling pins. And they push it a couple of feet and then inches and then take the roller and bring it around to the front and push it. It's not that long of a distance, but it, it took them a while to get it back here. And then they had to kind of lever it up onto this pad, which in itself, I had to get a mason to pour the concrete and make sure that they put the conduit in here for where the pipe is, uh, is going to come up for the electrical, which I'll show you. And so uh, that in itself, you know, the other option they had is they could have lifted it over the house with a crane. The house is kind of tall and that would have been a very expensive lift, but they do that in places. 
Um, and so, you know, you want to have a good generator company that knows what they're doing and they have, you know, these people have a rigging department and they deal with the process of like whatever it's going to take to get it back here, they figure it out. The other thing that happened here is I have a sprinkler system in the yard. And so the process of putting this here, we had to uh, dig up the sprinkler lines and then in the spring, I'm going to have to have the sprinkler company come and, and reroute everything and put it back. What I'm waiting for now is for the electrical to be run and for the gas to be run and then all those things to be inspected and signed off on and connected up and then finally we'll have backup power at which point we can almost guarantee we'll never have a power outage again where, where we won't need it. So let's open it up and take a look on the inside. It comes with a key, I mean, it's not really a security key or anything, just, just to turn these fasteners. This, this is the service side, I would call it the front side, they call it the service side, and then the non-service side, I guess. So you just uh, turn those things and then the door comes right off here. It's connected with a ground wire. So here's the inside of the service compartment. Like I said, this just arrived yesterday and it was already getting dark, so I took a quick look at it, but I think you're probably going to be seeing things uh, at the same time as I'm seeing them for the first time. So over here we have the controller. I think this is called the RDC2, at least uh, at the moment. This is the current Kohler controller, and uh, it's obviously the panel that you use if you want to change the settings or run a test or something like that or see if see if there's an error diagnostics there's a usb port here which i think can only be used by service technicians who have access to their special software to configure some of the more advanced options and um, update the firmware and stuff like that i suppose um, there are there is an ethernet connection and they have a service called on i think which allows you to do stuff online. I haven't really looked into that yet. I'm assuming it'll give you alerts if your generator is you know, uh, operating or has an error or if you want to start it remotely when you're in another country or something like that. Gas comes in the bottom here. It's some uh, gas valve solenoids. And the electric comes in into this panel here, which I'll see if I can get the cover off of that. So that's, that's basically what it looks like in here. And as far as the back goes, same type of door, same process. But all you're really seeing here is the back of the engine. And over here is where the 12 volt battery goes. The generator's electronics obviously have to work when the power goes out. So there's a battery in there. And then uh, there's a battery charging system that keeps it charged and ready to go. Here's a little closer look at the control panel there. And the engine itself. Big cooling fan there. All right, I'll get this panel off so I can show you what the electrical connection looks like. And so here's what's behind that panel. I expected there to be all kinds of complicated terminal blocks and things, but there's really not that much going on. You can maybe see down in here, yep, there's where the conduit is, so the wires can all come up from underneath. And then here's where the power comes out, so there's a big circuit breaker here, 100 amp circuit breaker, and then you're going to have your L1, L2 for 240 volts. There's a block here to connect the neutral, which you can see obviously is bonded to ground. And that's it for the power output from this machine. And then the only other things going on here are over on this side, we've got these wires here are for power in. So this generator doesn't just supply power going back to the house, but it needs a feed of 120 volts AC to go into here that basically runs the battery charger. So when the generator is off, it needs to be able to keep topping up that battery. And then over here, 
are the terminals for the communication protocol. They have something called RBUS, so there's going to be some low-voltage wiring that goes from here and then runs back into the house and connects to the transfer switch. And that's, that's the hookup. Like I said, the, the gas actually goes right there. And so once the gas line is in and the electrical is in, then uh, those are the parts. I got those instruction manuals out of the way. We can see the uh, oil filter here. And there's a bit of flex gas pipe there that they just have zip tied in so you can attach that. The, it's, you can't uh, have rigid gas connection to this generator. There has to be flex connection because the generator vibrates. Um, so I guess they, they give you that. And what else? Oh, um, I was looking for this and I finally found it now. Can we get a good shot of it? There is over here, over here, here it is, a block heater. So I knew that was optioned on here. I didn't know where they put it. And uh, everything's tucked in here pretty tightly, but that has a, interestingly enough, a, a power cord. So I guess you, uh, I guess the electrician will install an outlet. There are various accessories that um, need to just be plugged in to a separate outlet. I would have expected they'd have some sort of load center inside of the generator, but I guess simpler to do that. Oh, and there's the coolant reservoir in the back. I think I found all the bits and pieces at this point, so I'm going to button this thing up and go back inside and talk about some of the accessories, or they're not really optional extras, but we can talk about the transfer switch and the other things. Okay, so now let's take a look at the stuff that goes inside the house, or bolted right to the outside of the house, depending on where there's room. This big box here is the automatic transfer switch. Now this is designed to hold a variety of different options, so it's quite ridiculously large considering what's inside of it. Nevertheless, this is the one I have, and it's in a NEMA 3R weather-rated enclosure. I can take these thumb screws off the bottom here and take the cover off, and we can see what's inside here. A little bit anticlimactic since there's just another cover inside and a big 200 amp circuit breaker here. This box is designed to go up to 400 amps. I have the 200 amp, so I have a 100 amp generator, but I have a 200 amp breaker here because I have a 200 amp service coming to my house. Actually, before we dig in any deeper, I should probably have mentioned what an automatic transfer switch is. This is the device that controls the feed of power to either come in from the utility or to come in from the generator and to make sure that they never mix. So normally there's power coming in from the utility and the generator is off. When there's a power outage, first of all, we have to detect that there's a power outage, then signal the generator to turn on. The generator will start up. It takes a little bit of time to start up. And then when the generator is ready to go, we want to switch over so that the house is powered from the generator. And also very, very important that there's no connection from the house to the utility at that point, because if the generator is providing power to the house and it's still connected to the utility, then that back feed will actually go up to the transformer and energize the power lines. And somebody who's working on those power lines trying to restore power could be hurt or killed. So this is an absolutely critical safety component. And it's one of the big requirements if you're going to have a generator that's legally connected to your house, you have to make sure that you have a switch which is able to isolate the house from the utility. It doesn't necessarily need to be automatic, but a lot of people backfeed their house through a breaker and they have to remember to turn off the main and that's not okay and that's not legal because if it relies on you not making a mistake in order to not kill someone. Anyway, now that we have the cover off here, you can see the 200 amp circuit breaker because I have 200 amp electrical service coming into my house. So this breaker here is the service disconnect, normal utility. So what they call normal, there's a lot of different terms used in here, but sort of normal versus emergency. So normal means that the state where the house is being fed by the electric utility. And this is a circuit breaker for that. 
So now we can take another screw off here and take a look underneath this cover and see what's inside of here. Not very much. Okay. This slides up there, this slides over there. We'll get the instruction manuals out of the way. And so what's in here is some big chunky stuff. This is again the connection from the electric utility goes through this circuit breaker, big bus bars here that then feed it into this device here, which job is to switch between the generator and utility power. There is a manual switch here, which has to be operated in this particular model by sticking a screwdriver into this hole and then you can clunk it over. So that's, the, that's running off of the standby power and then this would be running off of the normal utility power. This is, of course, electrically operated when the generator turns on and this um, transfer switch actually flips that over. So what we've got here, again, utility power comes in these huge terminals on the top, goes through the circuit breaker, through these bus bars into the switching device. The generator power comes in here and then finally the feed out to the house comes out from here. There's a neutral bar, there's a uh, ground bar, and there's a bunch of stuff that's connected off here that goes into a controller, which we'll take a closer look at, which is mounted up over inside of here. They've also supplied a current transformer. This is something that is able to measure how much current is being produced by the generator, and that's used for the load shedding feature. So the controller that's in here also has a built-in load shed option Load shedding is a feature where if you have some high powered appliances in your house, like air conditioners, um, electric dryers, in our case, an electric car charger, you wanna make sure that in the event that your house is using more power than your generator can produce, you're able to automatically have those devices turned off in order to keep the more important things going like the heat and the refrigerator and, and things like that. And so how does that load shedding work? Well, this is what the company spec'd and sent me. This is a load shed controller, obviously made by Generac. I have a Kohler generator and transfer switch. That doesn't really matter because this is a completely standalone device. If I take the cover off here, we can take a look and you'll see it's another thing where there's not too much going on here at all. <laughs> this is just a contactor. Normally here in the US, we have 60 Hertz AC. There's a circuit board in here that monitors that frequency, and if it drops below 60 hertz, it'll switch this relay off and thus disconnect whatever load is connected to this relay. The reason that works is because when the generator gets overloaded, the frequency of the power that it's producing goes down, and it goes down enough to, to trip this circuit here. Obviously, when the motor is under more and more load, it's going to slow down, and so with a small portable generator, that is something that definitely happens. With these big generators, I think they might actually have some circuitry in them to deliberately reduce the frequency when they're getting close to their maximum load in order to activate a device like this. Nevertheless, I don't like this. This seems stupid to me because there's smarts in this box. This actually has circuitry to monitor the load directly and send a signal that says it's overloaded and we should shed these loads. And it, it actually has four load shed connections on it. So you could have four different things that would cascade as you use more and more power. And this is, I mean, it's not dumb, it's a smart device, but it relies entirely on monitoring that frequency and not the actual power usage. So I don't wanna use this box. I have another solution for this and we'll talk about that when I look at the guts inside here. So let's do that. And so here's a bit of a closer look at the internals here. Again, we've got that big circuit breaker. We've got the actual transfer switch here. Connection in for the generator power, connection out for the load, which in this case is the whole house. And uh, manual switch over there, terminals there. And then here's the actual circuit board. There's some wires connected here that go to the contactor and for power. 
There's a terminal block here for the load control. So these are uh, an AC input and then four outputs to control four different loads, up to four different loads, and then a connection here for the current transformer. This is for the communication protocol that goes out to the generator and allows the transfer switch to talk to the generator. Over here is HVAC control. So in addition to the four relays it has for load control contactors, you can run your HVAC signals through here and it can turn the air conditioners off as well. That's only useful if you can conveniently route your low voltage AC control through this box. And in my case, it's not near this box, so I'm not going to be taking advantage of that. Over here is a connector for a front panel display. They have like a little flat membrane keypad thing that you can stick on the front of this box that allows you to see what it's doing and also initiate a test. I've ordered one of those, but they're back ordered for a long time, so I don't have it yet. And that's basically what's going on in the automatic transfer switch. And here again is that Generac smart management module, they call it, the load control. We're going to eliminate that from the equation here. And this is what I'm going to use instead. This is a 63 amp, 240 volt relay with 120 volt coil. So basically this stays closed unless there's too much load on the generator, at which point it opens this, disconnecting, in our case, the car charger. So this is just a standard DIN rail contactor, and I'm going to put this in a weather rated box and have the electrician run the connection from the board here to that, and that should make everything chooch just the way I want it to. So that about wraps things up for now. I have my generator. I have my automatic transfer switch. I just need to actually get the electrical lines to run through this device and then have the gas all set up, have everything inspected and turned on, and I should have a working generator. So I will see you in the next video. Bye.